So um, we're going to talk about money. That's what we're going to talk about. Um, if you could stick up our first slide. Here we are. There's loads of, um, I don't know, there's lots of books these days. They always have been on how to make loads of cash really quickly. Um, half the time when you go on YouTube, there's some bloke that comes up in an advert beforehand, basically telling you how you can get rich really quick. And they, um, and then, the, you know, the kind of people that you look at in society, you look at your Elon Musk's and your Bill Gates and what's his face off Facebook. I forget his name now. And you think, you know, those guys, you know, the Facebook guy, he was just some student, wasn't he? And look at him now. Um, Bill Gates was the same when he, on the mic you think those are the wow that's amazing isn't it so i'm going to do um the, the that's what that's what this is this session is how to get rich quick <laughs> basically um except it's jesus's version of it and um we should, we should laugh nervously because there are plenty of pastors who've written books literally on how to get rich quick uh the guy from hillsong did one of those didn't they um but uh but Jesus's one is very, very different, very, very different. So why don't we pray? Lord Jesus, give us wisdom, we pray. Your word is cut, just cuts through. So cut through to us. Show us, give us wisdom, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to have, um, just, to, just to remember the context from what we heard earlier, the big picture was Jesus is coming back. So keep watch. Could be soon. Could be a long time. But are you ready? And the obvious question that you ask is, okay, but what does that mean? Am I just looking up into the sky, <laughs> keeping watch? What does it mean to keep watch? What does that actually mean? And that's what this parable is going to teach us. So who's got my reading for us? Great, come on up. Um, if you can click us onto this slide, here's a question for you. Same as the last one. How are the good servants ready for the master's return? How are they, what are they doing that means they are ready. Because that's the question we were asking, isn't it? How, how do we get ready? How were they ready? Go for it. So Matthew 25 from verse 14. Again, it would be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his wealth to them. To one, he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, to another one bag, each according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. The man who had received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gave gained five bags more. So also the one with two bags of gold gained two more. But the man who had received one bag went off, dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share in your master's happiness. The man with two bags of gold also came. Master, he said, you entrusted me with two bags of gold. See, I have gained two more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Master, he said, I knew that you were a hard man, harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. His master replied, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then, you should have put my money on deposit with the bankers, so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. So take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has ten bags. For whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. And throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Thank you. So, now I love it when I don't know about you. I'm a bit like this. I love it when you read the Bible and I've realised I was wrong. 
<laughs> do you ever do that? Like, oh, oh, yeah. It's a great moment because you're learning stuff. Now, I don't know which version of the NIV you've got because there's two versions of the NIV, which is really annoying. But when I grew up, the old days, it was called the parable of the talents. <clears throat> and now the new one has got the parable of the bags of gold, which is probably quite a good change because, I mean, the, the Greek word is talent and talent just means a, a big, big bag of gold. If you've got the same footnote I've got on my one, my one's got a little lay at the bottom and it says uh, a talent was worth about 20 years of a day laborer's wage. That's quite a big bag of gold. 20 years of cash. And what's the average wage? 25K. So that's, you know, it's for, for, for half a million quid. That's a big bag, right? So this guy's got half a million. This guy's got, you know, a million. And this guy's got two and a half million. I mean, it's a, it's we're not talking about Downton Abbey servants. Do you know what I mean? This is these are stock traders. This is big tons of cash that have been given to each of them. <clears throat> um, but see, I guess when I was growing up, it, it was the it was the power of the talents because that's the Greek word talent. It's just this big big bag of gold. And so my assumption was that what you've got here is you've got Jesus. He's giving us all talents. He's given you more talents than you, and you've got slightly less talents, but we've all got the talents that he's given us, abilities, things we can do. And he wants you to, to use the talents that you've been given to do good things for his kingdom, and uh, he'll reward you if you do well. Now, I, I don't think that's right. If that's the way you still come out at the end of this, thinking that's the way you read it, I don't think it matters because I think the difference between what I'm about to say and what you think is waffer thin. So I don't think it matters too much. I think you come out at the same end. But have a look at verse 15, for example. Verse 15. To one he gave five bags of gold, to another two bags, and to another one bag, and here's the key phrase, each according to his ability. So he's looked at his three servants and he's gone, this guy over here already has a lot of ability. So I'll entrust him more gold. And this person over here, is, he's, he's got some ability. So I'll trust him. This guy over here is not quite so able. So I'll entrust him a little bit less. So the abilities, their talents, precede the amount of money that's given to them. So I don't think it's about him giving us talents and abilities to do stuff and get on and do them. I think he's looking at us, knowing what we can do. And of course, he gives us gifts, doesn't he? So they're gifted anyway. And he sees our gifts and our where we and our stations and our situation. And he gives us what? What is this big bag of gold? And it's not an insignificant amount of money. It's a, it's a big ton of money. So what is this? Money. Let me give it away, what I think it is. I think it's the same as the previous parable with the two servants. And I think it's going to be the same as the sheep and goats. And I mean, I think it's the same idea that's being built all the way through. Do you remember the previous one with the, the, the wise and the faithful servants, the shorter one we looked at the end of 24? He said, I'm, I'm off for a while, and I want you to do what? Feed the other servants. I'm giving you a really important job. Your really important job is to make sure the other servants are well fed and looked after. This one, he's giving them, I'm off for a long while, and I'm giving you a big bag, something really important, big bag of gold. What's this precious big bag of gold? I think it's the same thing. I'm giving you some people to look after. They're really precious. They really matter to me. And I'm giving you more to look after because you've got more ability and I'm giving you less and I'm giving you even less, but we've all got people to care for, look after. And we'll see this when we get to the sheep and the goats even more clearly, because the judgment will be on what did you do for the least of these brothers of mine? So in other words, the, my point is that all the way through these parables, it's the same idea. Master goes away. There's all these people. What are we doing to look after, to care, to make a profit. It's all the same. They're just different metaphors, but it's the same idea. And this, it's really valuable. He really cares about it. And we wanted to make a profit. I think that's where he's going in this. If you disagree with me and you still think it's talents and gifts, I think we'll come up to the same way in the end because you'll say you use talents and gifts to help people. No, people give to help you come out. But I think he's going... 
So to be made. The big question that we're asking today is, what does that mean? What does that mean to make a profit with the bag of gold that I've been given? What does that look like? The people that he's given me responsibility for at this stage in my life and in my life. What does that mean? Well, go on to the second slide. Jesus rewards those who make a profit. So let me read. Let's read a bit more. Verse 19. I, 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 you know, when you, I even just never noticed this detail before until it was just read there. Let's see verse 19. After a long time. So they are. That's the parable of the bridesmaids. You see, they, they build on one another. So it's been a long while. Okay. And these guys have got enough oil in their lamps. The master of those servants returned, settled accounts with them. The man who had received five bags of gold brought the other five. Master, you can imagine his face. He's really excited. This is the moment he's been waiting for because it's been a long time and he's been working really hard for this moment. So this is a great moment for him. You can imagine the excitement in his voice. Master, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I've, I've gained five more. And his master replied, well done. Well done. Good and faithful servant you've been faithful with a few things i will put you in charge of many things come and share in the master's happiness and you see exactly the same with the the guy with the two bolts the two bags what does it mean to make a profit well it could mean that he um was, was given five christians to look after and he evangelized five more and made five more it could mean that i, I wouldn't preclude that but um i wonder if he's talking about fruitfulness growth in people in my church we, we have our i don't know we have our mission statement thing i don't know if you do that kind of thing but what we're trying to do in our church i think and what which what the bible teaches is that we're trying to grow in our faith in god and we're trying to grow in our love of each other both of those because of jesus okay? and we want actually there's a third we want people to come into christ as well so it's evangelism but as Christians, we're trying to grow in our faith and our love. And therefore, not only am I wanting to grow in my faith and grow in my love, but I'm also wanting to encourage others to grow in their faith and their love. That's why that uh, Hebrews verse here was brilliant, because that's why we meet together to, con to spur one another on to love and good deeds. We're helping each other grow in our love. We want to help others grow in our faith. We're, we're, we're just trying to grow the garden, bear fruit, make a profit. It's all the same metaphors or the same idea. And if I was to do that, if we were to do that, what will happen? And that's what this, where this really focuses on. What happens when the master comes back, when the Lord Jesus comes back? Well, there's, there's three rewards, three aspects of the reward. If you can click on, they are honor, responsibility, and happiness. Let's just zone in on these. So the first thing, he says that brilliant phrase, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now, all of us care what other people think of us. Don't pretend you don't. But there are certain people whose opinion really matters of us. You know, there's some people, if they say, well done, you, you, you know, I mean, a, a classic illustration would be X Factor. Did you ever used to watch X Factor in the old days? It isn't on anymore, isn't it? They, you have all these other goon uh, judges who's, who are a waste of space. You know, they're just all fluff, aren't they? Amanda Holden and the Irish bloke, and um, I can't even remember any of their names now. Um, they, they yabby, 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 yeah, they talk. But actually, it was only one person's opinion that actually matters, wasn't it? It was always Cal. What Cal said, if he said they're good, then they were good. And if he said they're rubbish, then they were rubbish. And the opinions of the others was largely a waste of time. And so it is with Jesus. Can you imagine the day... When Jesus says to you, what's your name? Edmund. Jesus says to you, Edmund, well done, good and faithful servant. Who have we got over here? Darren, one day, can you imagine the day when Jesus says to you, in front of all these people, Darren, well done, good and faithful servant. You put your own name in there. It's the, it's the, I don't know, metaphorically, it's the thing you'd hang on your heaven wall. You know, it's the, it's the day you'll always remember. It's the pivot day of history almost. It will just, it will just 
it will just echo down through the centuries. And, you know, I think I just, I just want to encourage you who have dreams in a certain life of someone else's dream, maybe it's or a or someone, you know, particular thing that someone said, I remember once someone said something about me and I'll always, it, it kind of hung over me for years. And, but really, there's only one comment that will really matter. Only one view of you, one, one opinion. And it's not cows, it's Jesus's. His is the big one. And it will be there on that day. That's what these parables are really about. So one is the reward of honor. Well done. That's such a big well done. Then there's this reward of responsibility. So verse 21, you've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. A few things. He's given them half a million quid plus. It's not a few. But but for him, this is in comparison. This is just a few things. So, so if you if you get the, the metaphor right, the reward is like, what kind of reward is that? In, um, in Luke's telling of it, in the parable of the miners, it's called, you know, this guy's got five miners. I'll give, I'll put you in charge of five cities, Jesus says. <laughs> the, the, uh, the reward is exponentially greater. I mean, it's ridiculously over the top. And it's a test, isn't it? It's a test, like I said earlier. He's giving us a little bit, but in, actually the little bit is really precious. <laughs> but in it, in comparison, it's the small bit. And if you can be faithful with what I've given you in the years and the abilities and the, what you've got now, then that's exactly the person that I want to be in massive responsibility for eternity in my kingdom, in heaven. Okay? I think it's, it's, it's easy to have the wrong idea about heaven. Heaven is this flat line place where everyone's identical. It's like a kind of version of communism, but as a, heaven, a Christian version, no, no. There are, there are people who will be rewarded more than others. There'll be people that are honoured more than others. There'll be people given more responsibility than others. The first will come last, the last will come first. Just like in every society, literally every society has some people who have more responsibility and honour and others have less. That's just the way society works and heaven will be the same. And yet the people who have the greatest honour, not the people that bought it or the people that were most well connected or went to the right college or had the right parentage or greased their way up the pole, whatever the phrase it is, but the people that you'd exactly the people you'd want to be there because they were the ones that with that responsibility were faithful. And so that's exactly who you should. That's exactly the way it should be a proper meritocracy. And that's what heaven will be like. It's worth just getting our head around this because I think um, as Christians, we can think, um, okay, uh, that judgment and judgment day, we have a very, um, flat line way of thinking about it it's do i believe in jesus or not and that is really important we will all be in heaven by grace and yet at the same time on judgment day we also have to give account for how we served our master lord jesus and there will be different rewards so you need to think of judgment day in, in kind of two bits almost if i was to um there's a parable isn't there back in chapter 20 where uh, of matthew where he talks about the guys lounging around in this in the in the market square who haven't got any jobs and they're they're unemployed and the, the master comes in and, and gives this person a job and then gives this person a job so suddenly that by grace they have a job and he gives them different jobs at different times of the day so if, if you were to kind of plug that parable with this parable you, you, what you'd have is you'd have these three servants in this parable, the five and the two and the one, but it started out with them lounging around in the market square with nothing to do and they're not employed. And so the master comes and employs them by grace. And then once they're employed, they serve their master who's gone away and he comes back and rewards them. So do you see that as Christians, we're all saved by grace. The only reason we're in the house, the only reason we're servants is because Jesus saved us. And so no one on the last day in heaven or for the rest of forever in heaven will go, didn't I deserve it? None of us earned it. It's really important we understand that. We're all saved by grace. You cannot do your way into heaven or get in because you're good enough. But now that I am saved, and this is the bit Christians often miss, okay? Now that I am saved, who am I? Jesus is my Lord. That means master. That means boss. That's what it means. 
and therefore I'm his servant or slave. I work for him now. I'm in his employment, and he's gone away. And what I do now that I'm saved by grace, praise the Lord for dying for me and cleansing for me from my sin. Now my job is to work in his employment. He's now my Lord. And so being a Christian isn't there and waiting because I'm saved. It's I for my And one day he will come back and reward those who's working for him. So I think there's just a bit of a change that some Christians have to get into their head. Being a Christian isn't just I believe in Jesus. It's I believe in Jesus. He's my savior and my Lord. I work for him now. I've got a job to do. And so I will be rewarded for that job. So that's what this reward is. And it's exponentially bigger than, than the responsibility it gives us now, which is still precious. So that's the second thing. And then the third one then is the reward of happiness. It's worth just meditating on this. Look at verse 21. Come and share your master's happiness. Come in and share your master's happiness. It's just like the bridesmaids. And they come on into the, 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 uh, the feast. Um, Inside, there's happiness. Outside is the opposite, isn't it? You get that in verse 30. Um, weeping and gnashing of teeth. So there's joy or there's sadness. Heaven is often described throughout the scriptures as a house and a party, feast. The parable of the um, the wedding banquet, you know, was inviting the guests or, or the parable of the, the prodigal son where the son's inside having the fattened calf and the other son, is he going to come in or not? It's often described as a party or or um, Jesus uh, turning the water into wine. It's that picture of a party, a place of abundance where there's no lack, a place of joy, a place of love, a place without suffering, a place without sadness, a place without death a place of peace, a place of great happiness. The thing that we're all actually working so hard for in life is to make our lives more comfortable or happy. It's what everyone's doing. And this is the place of happiness and comfort. But heaven is not just a place of abundance, happiness, comfort, joy, etc. It's not the place itself. The centerpiece is is the person, is the bridegroom. Imagine going to a um, a uh, wedding reception, you know, all the food and all the dancing and all the joy, but there would be no bridegroom or bride there. It would be bizarre. What you're rejoicing in is their marriage. They're at the centre of it. Well, that's, what, that's where the joy radiates from and makes all the other joy. And so he says, come and share your master's happiness. Isn't that lovely, see? It's not just going for a place of happiness. It's going for a place of happiness because I'm sharing it with him. It's his joy. It's his reward. It's his happiness. And we get to be there because he's at the center of it. So heaven isn't a place with brilliant, you know, we think of heaven as, a, I don't know, eternal snow uh, ski slopes or, you know, the most amazing surf or a beach that you can sit and read a book on for the rest of forever. It's not the it's not just the thing itself. There is joy, there is happiness, but it's because he's at the center of it. You share it with him. So there are that's the uh that's the reward. Let's think about the other the other chap, the the uh the third one. Jesus punishes those who make no profit. And that's where the punch is coming, isn't it? From verse 24. Let me read in verse 24. Then the man who had received one bag of gold came. Now you go to read really carefully, trying to read between the lines about what he says. He says, Master, see his relationship. Master, he said, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So I was afraid. And I went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here is what belongs to you. Now, that's a very well rehearsed speech. He's, he's been ready for Jesus to come back, actually. He's ready for the master to come back. And he's got his ducks all lined up. And he, to him, that you can see the way he says it, it, this sounds totally reasonable. Have you ever done this where you're, 
you've got an excuse for why you haven't done something. I haven't done handing me essay or whatever it is. And you've got your excuse already lined up and you've got it word perfect. So that when you go in there, you go and deliver it. And the person that's marking your essay will go, oh, I totally understand. That makes so much sense. That's totally fine. I think that's what he's thinking is going to happen here. I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you've not sown and gathering where you've not scattered seed. So what's his view of, of the master? That the master is giving them money to look after. I'm giving you my money to look after. So you make me a profit. And I don't get anything out of this. Jesus being a church, these people look after. Okay, what this? Thing out there. I bother doing work. Anything else? Just doing it for him. It's just slog. It's just juicy. I don't got to bother to do that. Um, if you if you put this in with the other parable, the other parable is. Do you remember the the, the previous one with the two servants? He got he um he he beats the the servants and he let's read it and let's find it um. If you look at verse 49 of the previous chapter, he began to beat his fellow servants and eat and drink with drunkards. Do you see, in other words, instead of doing my job, I'm going to live for myself and not bother with the, the responsibility you've given me. And I think that's exactly what this guy is doing. You see, I resent making a profit for you, doing stuff for you. I'd rather be out making a profit for me. Why should I make a profit for you? That's not fair. So instead of doing his job, He's off doing another job. And lots and lots of Christians live this way. Why should I bother working for you, Jesus, with these bags of gold you're giving me? Because I've got much more important. I want to make a profit for me. I want to make a profit for you. Why should I bother working in a church and helping other people and serving and loving and doing serving jobs for other people when I could be out, I don't know, doing my job or getting a name for myself or earning myself a profit or getting myself a nicer house or doing well for my, fluffing up my own pillows? I can't be bothered with yours. And it's a failure to understand my job. Who am I? He's my Lord and I'm his servant. Who am I working for? Am I working for me? Or am I working for him? And he thinks, well, it's totally reasonable. I did the right thing. Loads of Christians think that way. I live, I live my life for myself. What's the problem? As long as I believe in Jesus, that's all that matters, isn't it? As long as I'm a, as count as a as, as his servant, as long as I've got that job title, that's all that matters. I don't have to do anything. So this is where we drink in. We just have to take this challenge. Look at verse 28. So Jesus says, and he thinks Jesus is going to go, oh, that's fine, mate. Don't worry about it. Jesus says, no, take the bag of gold from him and give it to the one who has 10 bags. All those people you should have loved and cared for, now someone else is going to do that. You've lost your job now. They'll still be cared for, for someone by someone who's trustworthy and good, but not by you anymore. For whoever has, verse 29, will be given more, and they will have an abundance. There's the reward. But whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. So I think this, this, the first thing, if we can kick us on to that, yeah, their punishment, first punishment is loss. Even what good things we have now as Christians and what grace we had would have been taken from us. But then finally, oh, I've put up there a punishment of fear and despair. You just meditate on that verse 30 for a moment. We don't talk about hell enough. Throw that worthless servant outside into the darkness where there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Um, Jesus talks about hell in these parables a lot. We've seen it in verse 51 weeping and gnashing of teeth, and we'll see it in verse 46 later in the chapter as well. Darkness is a place of terror, fear. It's really scary. I always remember a mate of mine told me a story where he went on holiday to um, with some friends, and they were in the, I think it was the Sahara Desert. And you know, when you go out into the proper countryside, maybe we can do it here, you can really see the stars and everything, but darkness is proper dark. Yeah, I mean, you, you can't see your hand in front of your face like that. And they did a gag on him. So he fell asleep in the tent at night and they, they took the tent and all the stuff and they moved it about 
10 yards, not very far away. And he woke up and he thought they'd left him because he couldn't see them. And he was terrified. It was so dark. And then he obviously heard the little glass. <laughs> it was great fun, you know. But for a moment, it was real terror. Darkness is terrifying. Hell is terrifying. Hell is a terrifying place. And it's a place where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. When was the last time as an adult you wept? Can you remember? Have you ever heard another adult? Can you remember hearing another adult weeping? It's, it's a rare thing. It's awful. And that's, that's what categorizes hell. It's not a place where you're going to have fun with your mates. It's grief. Pink. And I don't know, that driven to see, or is it frustrated? This was their Lord being banished to hell forever. Imagine someone who grew up with knowing the gospel. Maybe they even went to church. Imagine what it'd be like to be in hell where it's terrifying and we knew, and we didn't do it. We thought it didn't matter. Can you imagine that? And on and on and on, and it never changing. I can't do hell strong enough. I just can't do it strong enough. We've got to look at these verses and go, anything in life but that. I've got to do anything. I've got to change everything so that that doesn't happen for me. We've got to hear when he says this stuff. He is not some sort of masochist or, or hateful person speaking in this way. He's, he's just wanting to punch us hard in the face so that it's not us. Just, we've got to hear this. So let me ask a question. Here's the big question that you leave. <laughs> it's a strong parable. You come away thinking, is that me? Which one am I? Don't you? I'm, I'm asked for a question I ask. Am I making a profit for my Lord Jesus? What does that even mean? And I'm going to be really annoying and tell you the actual application of that is not till tomorrow. <laughs> it's in the next talk. <laughs> so he kind of leaves you going, oh. Um, let me just finish this way, though. Let me finish by trying to emphasize. I think the difference between the wise and the faithful servants in this parable really is their attitude to their master. I think that's the underlying big difference between them. The faithful servants, he's away, he's gone. And they're working away. I mean, do you remember when you were at school? <laughs> what happens when the teacher goes out in school? Actually, it's different, isn't it? Some kids, some kids get on, don't they? And they work. But there's plenty of others that don't, right? Teachers away, do what I want. Jesus is away. And it, and it shows what we think of, of our Lord with how we live our lives, doesn't it? The, the, the wise ones can't wait for the day. They're so excited for the day when he gets back because they're waiting for it. They're watching for it. They know it's coming. And so they're ready. Look, look, Lord, look. Because all the time you've been away, I've been working really hard for you, with your money, with the, what you've given me. And that's what they're focused on because that's their job, actually. Whereas the wicked, lazy servant, he, he actually, it, it, was, it was what he thought of his master that was the key, wasn't it? You're a hard man. I don't want to work for you. I don't want to make a profit for you. And so I think what re really helps me when I think, just, just to meditate on as we finish, is who, who is Jesus to me? Lord Jesus. You can see it in your prayers. I see it in my prayers. Lord Jesus, I am your servant. And I'm serving you. And I, I, I love you. And I can't wait for you to come back. 
and I really, really want to make a profit for you. I'm not, the, I'm, you know, there are plenty of other people that are doing a better job. There's a guy over there that's doing the five. It might not be me, but I'll tell you what, I really, you know, with what I, with who I am and what I've got and what you've given me, I really want, I really want to make a profit for you. And do you know what? To everyone who says that, whether you've got five or two or however many, did you notice it's exactly the same thing Jesus says to both of those two servants? He says, well done. Not well done to the five and oh, you've done all right to the two. <laughs> he says exactly the same. Well done. Come and share my master's happiness. I'm going to give you abundantly more than I gave you to look after because you have been faithful. We'll think more about that, what that looks like even more tomorrow. Let me pray. And then actually, if you want, if you want to ask questions, I've got a couple of minutes for questions. So have a think about that and we'll pray. Let, let me just pray. Do you know what? I'm just going to give a bit of space so that you can pray on your own and then I'll pray. Lord Jesus, our Lord, our master, our boss, our heavenly king. We, we love you and we want to serve you with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind and with all of our strength. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for dragging us out of the sinful gutter and forgiving our sins, making us your servants in your house giving us your spirit giving us spiritual gifts that we can serve one another and love one another and the joy of the hope of eternal life and this amazing reward which is so beyond our imagination and utterly undeserved by your amazing abundant grace we're sorry where we haven't served you with all of our hearts our mind and strength thank you that you forgive us our sins and we want to, we want to, we really do. With all that we've got and that we're, all we've been given, we want to serve you with all of our heart, all of our soul, with all of our mind and with all of our strength. We do. And we can't wait for the day when we see you face to face with our own eyes and hear your beautiful voice with our own physical ears and when you say, Mark, well done, good and faithful servant, I can't wait for him. So, Lord Jesus, with all the days that you give us before you come back, which could be a long time. May you encourage and prompt us and fill us so that we can serve you in every way for your glory and for our good. Amen. <laughs>